in the first lecture we have mentioned how genomics assisted breeding is being used for development of hybrids. Um, here it is for the genetic studies, for teaching and all that. Uh, well, now let us understand how teaching, uh, gene teaching uh, genetics in classroom happens. Well, uh, in fact, what happens is in our days also and even today also genetics is introduced in the school in class 8. In which class you people have gone through genetics, Mendel's first law, uh, second law? Nine. Nine. But nowadays it is in class 8 actually. Everything is getting advanced, so pre So, um, uh, then what happens is first time the st school students they are you know exposed to genetics. They know biotechnology before Mendel's law because of YouTube and the different, different uh, projects they are given in the school. And they know very, very well that biotechnology can do this, that and all. You can take a gene from some organism, you can put it here, it can be there. So if you ask the school children what do you want to become in future, they will say I want to be a doctor or maybe an engineer, um, maybe a biotechnologist. Nowadays also people started thinking. Uh, students, somebody may say I would like to go to NASA, I want to be in astronomy, Chandrayaan 2 is now a buzzword. I want to join ISRO. So people have their own, I mean students have their own, I, I would say own uh, futuristic aspect involved in it. But hardly you will find anybody at the school age to have an, any, uh, I would say inclination towards a subject, subject like genetics. Why? Uh, the reason is uh, very, very, you know, uh, pertinent. The reason is, uh, even today in our MSc PhD classroom, we talk about when Mendel's law, we sh explain genetics like this. We have a table where seven characters are there, we either write it, then we show how segregation takes place, tall versus short and then F1 becomes tall, then F3 we have tall, short and all that we can draw. You can also have checkerboard and you can show three is to one segregation. So it is basically on line diagram or whatever is written on the, on the book. So uh, if I, you are asked that well, what you want to become in future, definitely we try to avoid this rather than we want to become something where you have some 3D models where you know how the motor runs. It is a very astonishing thing from a, from a school children, isn't it? They have a project. Somebody can say I, I want to become a, want to pursue chemistry because bonds are like this. Somebody wants to say I want to read geography, you see. And uh, biologists are also there. We have a 3D heart, we know how heart function. So, so that helps students to go towards medical science, right? Uh, many of the students, uh, my daughter's uh, friends, they want to become a cardiologist. Forget about a doctor, they want to be a specialist <laughs> as in cardiology. Okay. And then you have also physics part of it, you know, how the universe is. Because the reason is very, very uh, pertinent that we have something to get impressed with. You have a model uh, which you can see how it operates. But then in genetics, hardly we have any models to, to explain or to actually visualize this is how 3 is to 1 or this is how, you know, 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1 takes place. We do the same checkerboard with counting and then we write A dash B dash is equal to 9 and all those things. So with this, uh, what happened, there is a genetics uh, trust is there. Uh, it was, uh, um, it is here at IRA at NRCPB. Uh, Dr. Bhatt is there, he is uh, secretary of the genetics club. So they are routinely, uh, they train the school teachers. Okay, you, we cannot teach the school children because they are so large in number and we are so small a, a group. Okay, so they found that the, the best way to uh, teach genetics to a student is to teach the school teachers who can in turn go back. Uh, so if you teach one st school teacher, he or she can go back and teach maybe 1000 school children in 3 years or 5 years of time. That was there. So while interacting with them, we could realize that uh, there are also a lot of gaps uh, there in the, among the school teachers uh, to comprehend and to explain to the students. Right. So, so with this, then we started uh, working on to develop a maize kit. Now, maize is a wonderful crop in the sense that in a cob you can see each grains and you can see a lot of colors variations and so on and so forth. 
which, which is not possible in a crop like rice, wheat, because the grains will shatter. You cannot preserve the panicle uh, for a long time, although you can do it. And further, you don't, don't have that much variation as you find in maize in the grain itself. All right. Every crop has its own advantage and disadvantage. Uh, so with this, uh, then in division of genetics, uh, we are all working in market selection program on, on or genomics assisted breeding in quality. There are other breeders who are working on abiotic stress, biotic stress she was talking about. We have several objectives. But then hardly possibly we look into the fact we should also start developing some, some genetic stocks which will be helpful to the students. And here students means uh, not only the school children, even students in the undergraduate days also, even in postgraduate days also, even in PhD days also. Because seeing is believing. If we can explain something by showing some some cob, uh, look, this is how the segregation takes place. It will it will be you know um, we will have a different interest. So normally there are a lot of if you are a breeder you are work, work with so many things. Many of the things, especially the mutants, may not be directly useful to you, but then maybe it may be useful for a classroom. So that's how we started working on that. And for last three four years we have developed so. Uh, uh, a good number of genetic stocks which can explain a lot of basic genetic principles which can be introduced not only in school but also equally it is equally good for undergraduate and the postgraduate school uh, postgraduate studies also now how many of you have seen uh, in your uh, in your days in postgraduate a typical mendelian ratio of 3 is to 1 or 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1 in any crop in any trade Please raise your hand that I have seen it with my own eye in the field that some are tall or some are short or some are this or some are that. Who has seen it in, in the program? You have seen it. What is the trait? Huh? Hair, hair formation and a pod of Vigna species. What was the variation? With hair and without hair. Okay. And uh, was there, was it fitting into a particular ratio? I have seen the thing. Uh. I haven't checked. No, but could you see that there was more of without hair, less with hair, or with hair is more, uh, something like that? Yeah, I see. Okay. Any of you had seen typical 3 is to 1 segregation? Uh, in which is which crop? Okay. What is the trait? Flowering. Flowering means what? Base to flowering won't uh, normal. Huh? It's a quantitative character. You won't see a typical segregation. If you see purple color versus white flower color, I can understand it could be a qualitative trait. Okay, so my point is it is very difficult until and unless you are so much involved with the crop and that crop has got that much benefit. If anybody is working in May, anybody is working in May? You, you could you see any, any, any variation in the field, may not be in your own experiments. What is the trait? No, uh, variation will always be there, tall, short and all. But was it into the ratio of 3 is to 1? Is, has anybody counted and said, look, this is the trait which is qualitative? I am sure it will be very rare. Anybody in maize? You are working in maize. Uh, where are you from? Okay, which trait you are working with? Sir, I am working on Okay, any of the trait you found in your maize crop which is segregating in a typical ratio of anything, 9 is to 7, 3 is to 1? You haven't seen it. Okay, that's what actually happens because most of the economically important traits, once you deal it with, is either quality or shattering of pods and all that. We normally either do backcross breeding or or a conventional way of pedigree based breeding. We hardly see, and therefore we know that this will happen, but we haven't seen so far. Uh, same thing was happening with us also. We are rejecting those materials which had this kind of segregations which we were, did not want it. But with this kind of uh, training, uh, we realized that. So we went ahead with now collecting the stock, developing the stock, and then uh, I'll explain how it works. Now, as mentioned, uh, as compared to the other crop, maize is an amazing crop. Why? Because you have large number of uh, seed mutants available. You see the photograph, it's not much clear. You have, you have different shapes, size, colors, and so on and so forth, which is hardly you can find in any other crop. Um, and most of the seed mutants are monogenic. That is again the advantage. Okay, you are telling about flowering in lentil. It's a it must be a quantitative trait. 
then distinct morphology that means some are red some are white you can distinguish based on color some are plumpy some are shrunken you will see then another is if i give you an f1 cob f1 cob means the cob you harvest from the f1 plant or hybrid the seed is the next generation seed, seed is the f2 right so in the one cob you can see uh, i mean 400 to 600 grains are there in per crop in case of hybrid all the f2 grains are embedded on the cob so entire variation you can see just by looking at the cob if you want to see some plant type you have to grow 500 plants and go individually and see it right so so any seed trait is always advantageous next is it is easy to demonstrate that means if i harvest a cob i can i can you know there are also sh shelling out is also a possibility that means if it is dry the grain will be separated from the cob in maize um, the inner shank is called cob this is a maternal trait right and the maternal character and the seed is the hybrid uh, version isn't it which has the next generations right so <coughs> cob plus grain we call it as ear in maize uh, many times interchangeably we use cob means it is only the inner uh, shank on which the grains are embedded that white and sometimes red also it is there right so ear means it is cob plus ear right uh, so it is easy to demonstrate why because if i harvest a cob i can preserve it in my lab anytime you can come we can demonstrate drosophila is also another uh, uh, model organism but then to keep a drosophila to make crosses it is stage dependent it is time dependent if the cross is not ready you cannot be shown here it is anytime you open a box having cob you can demonstrate next is uh, no time specificity that means uh, there it is not, not dependent on time anytime it is available it can be given it can be given to you uh, no need of any field experiment like suppose may, uh, you want to show tall plant and short plant in case of p what you have to go you have to literally go the plant and then you have to go and count here everything you can see in the seed itself and uh, of course you can preserve it for a long uh, long year because in a cob nowadays uh, there is a, a thing is there is a varnish paint is there isn't it which we paint on the door so which is of transparent color if you can paint it on the cob it helps two purposes one is it acts as a glue so all the grains will be together it won't come out otherwise a, a maize cob grain will come out of once it is dried right which you do not want for this purpose and another is many times the storage insects will start eating the grains so if you varnish it no grains will be able to uh, you know damage it so you can preserve it for a long time so these are some of the advantages which is with maize and with this uh, now let us understand the whole thing we all know that mendel worked on seven characters and these are the different uh, uh, allylic forms i mean the polymorph poly polymorphism and if gene is there and uh, we also know that there was a pleiotropy that is white uh, uh, white flower was associated with white seed coat and the purple flower was associated with gray seed coat that we all knew it and uh, another thing is we should also know that female gametogenesis in plants like we have a egg mother cell capital a small a suppose it is heterozygous it will produce four uh, uh, four uh, ovule and uh, sorry four i would say after meiosis four cells and uh, two will be capital A, another two will be small A, so three will degenerate. So there will be 50 50 chance that the, uh, uh, that the cell meiosis finally, a, one of the cell will survive is either capital A, small A, then it will go for the ovule development. You have eight cells and then fertilization will take place. So there is a 50 50 chance that capital A will come or small A will come in a heterozygote. Uh, mean male also it is like this the if the pollen mother cell undergoes meiosis it produces four cells each of these four cells will mature into a pollen so again there will be two capital a and two small a so there is 50 50 uh, in female one pollen one egg mother cell will lead to finally one uh, ovule while here one pollen pollen mother cell will lead to four but in every case it is a 50 50 percent distribution of capital a and small a um, I do not want to go into the detail. We all are genetic students. If you make cross, you will get a typical 3 is to 1 or you will get typical 9 is to uh, 3 is to 3 is to 1. We know the law of segregation and law of independent assortments. And uh, these are exactly uh, the ratios which Mendel uh, uh, studied 
and one smooth and wrinkled, then, then this is the number of smooth and wrinkled seed uh, he got. And the ratio was 2.96 is to 1. Like that for each trade, there is a ratio. Now, uh, another important point is that uh, Mendel said each of these ratio is fitting into 3 is to 1. Now, we know chi-square test is done for to test uh, whether a particular ratio is falling into a particular pattern. So we do chi-square. And the chi-square test came in 1900 by Carl Pearson. Mendel published his, uh, presented his first paper in 1865, 35 years before Carl Pearson. So that time he could not test whether all of these are setting, fitting into 3 to 1, but he took it as 3 to 1, thinking there must be some small, small errors which is contributed to this much variation, but it is nothing but 3 to 1. Okay? So that was also one of the reasons of Mendel's success of, uh, you know, for to tell that, look, every trait is segregating 3 to 1. If you start thinking in 1865, why it is 2.3.01, why it is 2.96, I think nobody will come to any kind of conclusions. Okay? So that was one of the uh, greatness of Mendel that he took every ratio as 3 to 1. Law of assumptions also we all know, but then for Mendel's first law, there are five major assumptions which is not there in the law, like two gametes will be have equal frequencies, right? So if there is a lethality or something, you, you will get segregation distortion. Then the gamete should have equal survivability, then it should have ram, random union of gametes, then the zygotes will have equal survivability, and the zygotes should have equal fertility. So these are the assumptions of the Mendel's first law. As far as the second law is concerned, all the assumptions of the first law are also true. Apart from that, no linkage, no pleiotropy, and no cytoplasmic effect should be also there. So that we all know. Now look at here how we can demonstrate each and everything <coughs> using maize cop. Uh, so this is a maize cop which we all, these are the inbred lines. Uh, I'm sure in the field uh, that Vignesh has shown you, inbred lines will be sh uh, shorter. Uh, and when you cross two inbred lines, you'll get a hybrid. Hybrid is tall and all that. Okay. So the shorter version of inbred line is because of what? because of the inbreeding depression. So once you attain homozygosity, everything will become short, plant tight, ear, everything. So these ears are very small ears, although in a photograph it may be looking like this, but it is not very impressive as you see it in case of hybrid. So here we call it as seeds of the parent one, and the seeds are round, means whatever we see in maize. And we have one mutant called uh, shrunken seeds, where seeds are not plumpy and round. It is uh, having uh, crumpling. Okay. So it is shrunken. Okay? So this is because of a gene called SH2. This SH2 gene is responsible for sweet corn development. Right? Uh, whatever sweet corn we have in the market, majority of the sweet corn is having SH2 gene in homozygous condition, which is recessive. Right? But then what happens? Uh, why it is sweeter? Because it is not allowing the sucrose to go to starch. Okay? Starch is important for packing of seeds during maturity. So if it is if, we, if you have sufficient starch, you, it will have a good packing during maturity, you will get a round kernel. Okay. And here, since sugar is more, starch was less, so the packing got disturbed. That is why the kernels are shrunken. This is what it is. And it is the same thing, same trait, which Mendel studied in round seed and wrinkle seed. Okay. Similar situation. So, so here it is governed by capital SH2, SH2. Here it is small SH2, SH2. Now, once we made crosses, we use as a, uh, these two are crossed. This is the F1 seed. Okay, now in maize, uh, or for that matter, any breeding program, we have to understand this. Where the F1 seed will produce? On the female plant? Right? Where the F2 seed will produce? On the F1 plant? Where the F3 seed will produce? On the F2 plant? So, the plant will be previous generation, seed will be the advanced generation. Now, the seeds of the F1, which is produced on the female plant, is also having the round seed, which is very clear here. What does it indicate? It indicates roundness is dominant over the shrunkenness, because the F1, only the roundness is there. So if you can give these two, these three years to a, to a student, and it can be very easily then made him or her understood that what, what do you mean by dominance, right? So if you make crosses, one is wild type, another is mutant, the F1 is showing Whatever is the type, that is, is, the, is the dominant. We can also show the same with multiple <coughs> characters. This is another trait. Now, the uh, sweet corn in uh, US, uh, they, there are two genes which contribute to sweet corn. One is called shrunken 2, which, is, which I have mentioned. In India and in, a, in mostly in Asia, especially in China and all, it is a shrunken 2 gene which is used for sweet corn development. 
If you go to US and many parts of Europe, they like the sugary one gene, another gene, which is, a, uh, which is not allelic to each other, right? There, the sweetness is less, but as compared to SH2, but it, is got, it has got a good aroma and good uh, glossy appearance, okay? As I mentioned in the last class, you know, two things are very important. How it looks and how it tastes, right? So look-wise, it is much better, isn't it? What kind of vegetables, what kind of brinjal you will like, which is not infested with borer, right? But scientifically, if it is infested with borer means it is having less pesticide infestation, right? But we always like something very uh, uniform, glossy, having a good shape, good color, rather than a poor color and all that, isn't it? So eye matters. Second is the test, how, how it tests. So if it is not sweet, you cannot sell it as sweet cotton. So sweetness, is, I mean, test is also equally important. So here, the phenotype, which is, uh, what happens is, this is the round one. This is the sugary phenotype. Once it is dried, it has got a typical, fee. it is not as shrunken as what we have seen. It is little bit of crumpling is there, and it is like a resins. I always give an example of, you know, kishmish. We, we see the kishmish phenotype, you, you will see that. So we made, we made two stocks, one is dominant, another is, so it is capital SU1, SU1, SU1 means sugary one. It is the recessive SU1, SU1, if you may cross, the F1 seed is again plumpy. So that means, I mean round. So what does it indicate? The sugary one is again a recessive trait and the round one is a dominant trait. So this is also another example we can show the dominance. Now look at here. Uh, now we are trying to see the law of segregation. So this is the dominant, this is the recessive, and uh, this is the F1 plant once you grow, this is the F1 cob. F1 cob will be produced by the F1 plant, and these are these seeds are what? F2 seeds? Now if you see, these are the round, and these are the wrinkled one, this is, we call it as sugary. If you count, it is segregating exactly in threes to one. Uh, there is, uh, I think it is very clear that the round is more than sugary. Okay, if you count it, it is 3 is to 1. So here, we can very well demonstrate by giving a single year how segregation is happening. Segregation for the sugary genes, right? So round ones are what? Capital A, capital A or capital A, small A. Or the sugary ones are small A, small A. So with one cup, you can very easily demonstrate Mendel's first law, that is law of segregation where dominance is operating, right? So this is one. Now look at here, there are many examples. These are all F1 cobs, seeds are F2. Now here, it is a normal versus shunken. It is very clear, these are the shunken seeds. It is again segregating threes to one. Here, it is the purple. Somebody was telling what is, what is the colored maze in the first class. So these are the purple and these are the white. There is a gene called C1, colored one. If it is dominant, it will give you purple color. <coughs> if it is recessive, it will give you white color, no color. Of course, there are other genes like A1, A2 and so on and so forth. C is a, one of the major factors. Here also you see it is segregating exactly 3 to 1, purple versus white. Here, I don't know if it is much clear or not, there are some, these are yellow grains and these are all pale looking grains, isn't it? These pale looking grains are because of the high amylose content in the maize. Normally like rice, uh, we have 30 percent amylose, 70 percent amylopectin. High amylose means six, 50 to 60 percent amylose will be there. Uh, high amylose maize is very good for, especially for diabetic patients, because amylose, if you increase, the digestibility will be, uh, I would say, prolonged. Okay, so it won't be absorbed quickly in the blood. So any food you take where the sugar is absorbed in a longer period of time, that is desirable for the patients who are diabetic, isn't it? So nowadays uh, there is a trend that. Uh, like your, uh, like your, uh, you know, cellar rice. If you cr if you boil it, and another is the, you know, the atap rice that is which is uh, kacha rice. So because of the parboiling, uh, it gives starch in a much slower manner, right? So these are different different mechanisms. So here also, uh, it is there. The gene is because of the amylose extender. There is a gene recessive gene. If it is recessive homozygote, you will get these pale colored ones. So it will segregate three to one. Uh, these genes are, again another gene called waxy. if you go to southeast Asian part and even in the northeast, people like maize which are sticky, 
Okay, so we like people in the northeast and entire southeast Asia, China. We like sticky rice. We all know Japonica rice. Similarly, in maize also, they want sticky maize. So there is a gene called Waxi. Normal maize has got 70% amylopectin, 30% amylose. If you introgress Waxi one gene in recessive homozygous condition, your amylopectin is increased to 95 to 100%. It becomes very very sticky while cooking, when boiling or making soups. So the entire these these <coughs> these ones, these matte finished ones are or the pale ones are waxy, while these ones, which is having little bit of different color, are normal greens. So here also it is segregating exactly threes to one. Okay. Uh, if time permits, I'll show you the cobs, and there it will be very clear to you that how you have a maze practical some other day, I think on Monday. So we'll show you the cobs. So point here is I might try to make if you give these F1 cobs where seeds are segregating for traits, you can very easily explain Mendel's first law, that is law of segregation. Now another is uh, sampling. Sampling is very important in genetic studies. We always say there should be you know large sample should be there. If the sample size is small, what, what would it will cause? Deviations. Uh, deviations will be there. There, Okay, uh, you know in hardy Winber law, we, we use a term called random drift. So if because of the so small sampling uh, issue, sampling error, your frequency of the genes can go to either this way and that way. That we called uh, random drift. Okay. So therefore, in genetics, we can explain very easily how sample size matters. So this is the same cob where it is F2 seeds are segregating 3 to 1 and these are the rows in maize. So we have given marking 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 and each row we have counted how many are normal and sugary seeds. Okay? So in row number 1, there are 35 seeds, 27 normal, 8 are sugary. So the ratio is 3.38 is to 1. Row number 2, it is 5 is to 1. Row number 3, it is 3.25 is to 1. Row number 4 is 4 is to 1. Now look at here. Same cop segregating 3 is to 1 but the moment your sample size is smaller, somewhere around 30, 35, you know, many of the rows are not actually fitting to 3 to 1. Right? Now what we have done, we have taken the cobs, entire seeds from the same cob where 450 grains are there and it is segregating 3.26 to 1. So it is much closer than the variation. Okay? Closer to 3 to 1. We then pulled up 3 years. Total grain was something like 1800 and the ratio is 3.10 is to 1. So what happens, larger the sample, better is the fit to a particular ratio. So although we say as per checkerboard, there is four, four cell is important, four seed is good enough to explain 3 to 1, but in reality you may not get 3 to 1 just by taking uh, even 3 to 1. Now these are another classical example, not four seed, even 35 seed is also not essential, uh, is not uh, sufficient to explain 3 to 1. Okay? And, and since which of the seeds will show roundness and sugariness, sugariness, it is based on what? Meiosis, which is a random process and where the pollen will go and fertilize is also a random process. So none of the rows will ever show similar pattern of normal and sugary. Like here, both it is sugary, it is sugary and it is normal. In this row it is not there, here it is not there, here it is not there. So none of the row, it is like a barcoding. You know, every row has a different pattern of trait expressions. Okay, why? Because of that, it's a randomness in meiosis. Which egg will fertilize with what pollen is a random event. So the moment it is random, your probability of getting the same pattern is highly reduced, isn't it? So this gives an idea about how sample size is important. So any genetic study you do, you need to have good number of sample size, at least minimum hundred and plus something so that you can have your ratio but then if you are if you are if you are uh, studying multiple genes together so your sample size should be also large enough depending upon how many genes you are studying now another thing we study is the back cross and test cross we all know what is back cross and what is test cross but how many of us have seen back cross a uh, cob or for that matter any population which is having back cross but having distinct features it is again very less because here what we do this is a shunken one this is the normal one and F1 was backcrossed with this one. So here you see it is 1 is to 1 segregation, normal versus shunken and this is the backcross that means F1 was backcrossed with this. So here what happens either capital A capital A or capital A smaller, here either capital A smaller or smaller A smaller. 
right? So in the test cross, you see one is to one segregation for one gene, which is expected. And here in the back cross, if you cross with the dominant parent, you are not going to get any segregation. So with this, we can again explain to the students how test cross and back cross varies a lot. Well, uh, to, to understand this, this uh, seed structure are also equally important. In maize, a crop like maize, we have a pericarp, which a pericarp is a maternal tissue, it is 2M. Then, the, then is the alluron layer. Alluron layer is the outermost layer of the endosperm, isn't it? Which is a hybrid tissue, but the, gen but the uh, genotype is 3M. Then inside the part of it is endosperm, it is again hybrid tissue 3M. Embryo is hybrid tissue, but then 2M, we all know that. And this is pedicel, that is the base of the kernel, which is again a maternal tissue and 2M. So whenever you make crosses, you have to understand uh, which, where, you know, the variations will come as far as genotyping is concerned. Now, uh, this is a red colored maize, okay, and this is a, a yellow colored maize. Now, why red? Because the in maize, pericarp color is normally transparent. If it is transparent, you can view the endosperm color. So yellowness and whiteness means you are viewing actually the endosperm, your pericarp is transparent. The red maze which you have seen in many places, pericarp is red color. Since it is red, you do not see the endosperm color. So the endosperm of a red colored maze could be yellow, could be white, until you break open, you do not know, right. So here we say it is the, there is a gene, I uh, will explain later. So this is the red color, this is the transparent. So if you make F1, where this red color made is the maize is the female parent, your F1 will be red. If you use this as a female parent, so what happens? Your cob will be transparent, means the pericarp will be transparent. The reason is, here we are viewing the pericarp color which is maternally inherited. So here the pericarp is from the mother, but the endosperm and embryo is a hybrid tissue, right? So same thing happened with Mendel's seven character, of the seven characters, that seed coat color. One was gray, another was white, isn't it? If you cross, same thing, if you use gray as female, so your F1 seed will be gray, right? And that is what is, it is, look at here. It is a gray pericarp with white, F1 would be gray because the Pericarp is coming from mother. If you sulfate, what will happen? Your mother is having the pericarp colored. So therefore, all will be colored. So you are not getting any segregation in F2. But then if you go to F3, what happens? Only this part should show white color pericarp. While the other part that is Once you do the reciprocal cross, that is you are just swiping the parents, here the F1 is white because this is the female. So this, this part is called what? Reciprocal difference. And once you self it, this is F2 again, there is no segregation in F2. And once you go to F3, then again you will getting segregation. So this is, we all know in genetics there are two, con two terms which are very re re related name wise related, one is called uh, maternal inheritance. Any trait which is governed by cytoplasmic genes are called maternal inheritance. Another is maternal effect, where coiling of the snail example is always given, you know, dextral versus sinistral and what happens. So maternal effect can be explained by the seed coat color easily in maize because now here you see that it is the reciprocal difference. and. In maternal effect, you won't get segregation in F2, rather you'll get segregation by one generation delayed, that is in F3, right? And we shown here, uh, we took red and, you know, uh, this was a transparent one and try to understand this is the F1 cob, that means C is F2. So what happens? There is no segregation in C entire grains of the F2 seed is red because the pericarp is actually coming from the mother. So this is how by giving these cobs you can easily explain the maternal effect which any Mendel in his seven, one of the seven characters explained how it worked. Okay? So one is the 
roundness and the shrunkenness. Another is the seed coat color. It is very, very similar to Mendel's uh, two of the seven characters. Uh, co-dominance we all know, but then just want to mention to you that many times um, co-dominance is what? Where both the genes are, uh, you know, expressed. And uh, we always give a classical example like blood group. We have uh, AB blood group is the classical example of co-dominance. We always give sometimes these kind of examples. The white hen is crossed with a, you say, black cock, and then you have a, a F1, which is male, otherwise, has a both white and black feathers. So you try to, we try to say both the things are present. Similarly, a, a brown colored cow is crossed with a, say, white colored one, and then you have a patches, the F1. And then you have red and white, and then you have a, you know, uh, red and white. Though we say it is co-dominance, co in many books it is given, but actually it is not correct genetically. Co-dominance is the one where each and every cell will express both the alleles. Here what happens? So this part of the portion is expressing only white, where other allele is not expressing. Here only black is expressing, not the other part. Same is the case with here also. So this should not be given an example as a co-dominance, because here we try to see the whole organism as a whole, where both are expressed, but it is basically sectoral expression. In some of the sectors, the black is expressed. In some of the sectors, white is expressed. So, but it should not be given an example of codominance because codominance is one where each and every cell in AB blood group, you take any blood cell, both the cases A and B antigen will be there, isn't it? Not that in a human we have some A antigen blood cell, some B antigen blood cell. It will never happen, is it? So this kind of example we should always avoid. Tomorrow we'll be the teachers uh, in, in different capacities, whether, whether in the form of a you know like this, train somebody, or to or, to, or you may you may join uh, you know SAUs where you have to teach the undergraduate students. So these are some of the cases where we normally find there are errors in explaining certain things. So we should avoid this kind of examples. Like here, incomplete dominance also we know that we have red and yellow, red and white snapdragon, you get pink color, which is intermediate between two. Now, in maize, we can show another example, law of independent assortment, that means two genes segregating together. Now, here, it is the orange maize with a normal maize, more normal looking one that is glossy. And here, it is white. And uh, if you can see, uh, it is basically a very pale looking, it is basically waxy maize. So there are two traits which is segregating, yellow versus white and the glossy versus paleness, right. So once you go and make crosses, the F2 seeds, you see there are yellow glossy, there are yellow waxy, there are white glossy, there are white waxy. So all the four grains can be identified on a F1 cob, that is on a F2 seeds. And if you see, it will segregate exactly 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. Right, because two genes, both are your waxy gene is present on chromosome nine, and uh, the genes for yellowness is present on another chromosome. So it is independently uh, segregating. Okay, so with this we can also explain Mendel's second law of law of independent assortment that two genes are segregating independent of each other, and the ratio is nine is to three is to three is to one. Now another is the multiple allele. What is the example we always give on multiple allele? A, it is a AB blood group and ABO blood group and so on and so forth. In maize we can show it. Although it is a diploid organism, so multiple allele means what? We have to consider a population. In population we have to see how many alleles are segregating. Now we have seen per, uh, red maize, red pericarp color and transparent, right? If you look at very carefully, this is the cob portion which I was talking about. This is the pith on which the grains are embedded. Huh? Once uh, harvesting is done, how this, this part is used? This is used to generate heat during the cold time, when it is cold. So if you put fire on that, it will be burnt slowly. So this is one of the mechanisms, especially in the villages, to you know generate heat in the traditional way of burning these ones because these are useless. Uh, nobody will eat it. No cattle will have it, right? Okay. So here also there is a difference of color. This is white and this is reddish, right? It is because of the gloom. Gloom is the one where, on which the seeds are embedded, right? So here we have the purple pericarp and the purple cob. We call it cob. This this white portion. And here it is transparent pericarp that is yellow, and then red co red peri red cob. Here it is red pericarp, but there's white cob. Here it is transparent pericarp and 
white cop. Okay? So there are four alleles. We, we call it P1. P1 is the pericarp color 1. That's why the gene name is given as P1. After this, there are two letters given. The, fu uh, the first letter is R and the another letter is W. R for red, W for white. Now here, first you have to mention what is the color of the gray pericarp, then the color of the uh, cob. So here we write RR because R is the pericarp color and R is the cob color. Here it is W and R. First we have to mention the pericarp color, then the cob color. Here it is white, that's why you see the yellow color. So it is WR, it is RW and here it is WW. So there are four alleles which are in homozygous condition. So by looking at this, if you give the cobs to the students, you can very well demonstrate that although we are diploids <coughs> and maximum we can have two alleles, but in a population, there are possibility of multiple alleles. Blood group is easy to explain on the board, but can we show the alleles literally to see, look, this is the blood uh, cell and this is the you know, antigen sitting over it. We cannot demonstrate to the students, but by demonstrating this, we can explain also. Now, dosage effect is another important thing. Uh, unfortunately, the color variation is not much. There is a gene called R1. R1 is for the red one. The earlier pericarp color, P1, gives pericarp only in the endosperm. Only in the pericarp, not in the endosperm. This R1 gives anthocyanin. Somebody was asking about the colored maize. R is also one of the genes which gives colored maize. So anthocyanin will be accumulated in the endosperm, not the pericarp. Okay. So here, what we see the segregation of yellow and purple, this purpleness is actually the anthocyanin is present in the endosperm, and in yellow there is no endosperm, no anthocyanin present. Okay. So this the capital R1 and we call it NJ is a suffix. NJ is the Navajo, which is one type of allele which the name is given. <coughs> so recessive allele is small R1, capital allele is capital R1 NJ, or you can consider is R1 only. Now, if you make crosses and in F1, if it is heterozygous, you will have four types of genotypes in the endosperm in F2 seeds, if you can calculate it. All three are dominant two dominant, one recessive, one dominant, two recessive, and all the three recessive, isn't it? That is what is going to happen. Here, what happens, where all the three are dominant, it gives the darkest of the color. When one is dom two are dominant, the color is little bit fade. When one is dominant, it is much, much lighter. And when all are recessive, it gives no color, here it is yellow. So what happens, Antho it is a balance between anthocyanin and carotenoids. Carotenoids gives yellow, anthocyanin gives black color. So in presence of both, the black color will see. You know, even in watercolor, you take black and yellow mix, you will get black, right? So that's what it is. So since anthocyanin is not there in small R1, R1, and R1, you get the carotenoids are expressed. So this is an example of dosage effect. Crop like maize, dosage effect is very important because suppose each of the allele contributes two unit. So if you have three dominant allele, it will be six unit. So your color will be more, right? If you have two do two unit, two doses are there. So two plus two, four unit will be there. So since some of the genes, uh, you know, function as a dosage effect also. So these are the classical example where we can show that. Uh, so therefore, you have to remember one thing: the earlier example of dominance of sugary, shrunken, they don't have any dosage effect. Even one dominant gene is round. There also you have four types of genotypes. Now we are talking about endosperm. Because in maize, um, embryo is sitting beneath. We, we can't see much variation in embryo, em, em, embryo. It is the endosperm in which we see a lot of variations. So uh, being a geneticist, there will be four F2 genotypes possible in the F2 seeds. I'm, I'm sure it is much clear to you now. Uh, in some of the cases like sugary shankan, we do not have dosage effect, but here we have a dosage effect. Uh, how dosage effect can be explained? You have four, three genes. Everybody, every genes is getting transcribed, translated. So you have more proteins. More proteins means more activity. More activity means more final pigmentation. That is what it is. Uh, in maize, uh, we have also heard in genetics a term called Xenia effect, right? What is Xenia? It is the effect of foreign pollen on, on the endosperm. Okay, maize is again a classical example. Now look at here. This is a white maize. White maize is uh, governed by white or yellowness is governed by a gene called capital Y1. We call it as yellow one. Yellow one is nothing but 
phytoin synthase gene which has been used for development of golden rice. From golden rice to develop golden rice that PSY gene that is Y1 gene has been taken from yellow maize and apart from other two other one or two genes have been taken. So when capital Y1 is there that is phytoin synthase is functional you will get a yellow color or orange color. When it is a recessive allele small Y1 when it is non-functional you will get the white color. So in traditional rice it is the recessive Y1 which is present which is not functional and since in rice there is no natural variation they have taken it from maize. But in maize we have a natural variation. So we do not require golden maize it is already there. So you have to only breed for that. Now as mentioned there are preferences among humans white maize and yellow maize. In poultry it has to be invariably yellow maize. Why? We always like egg yolk which is yellow. If you, if you give egg which is whose egg yolk who are I am telling about who is, veg, who is non vegetarian we do not like egg yolks which is yellow white or the pale one we think it is less nutritious right. So therefore in poultry and another thing I mentioned that you know skin color all these are also important factors for export. So, so they need to give yellow maize for the poultry that is why uh, you know yellow maize is there. White maize sector is normally preferred as food if you go to Africa. I, I mentioned 70 percent of the maize is used as food there. There they, they do not take yellow maize, they take white maize. Although yellow maize is what? Nutritionally more superior than white maize because you have carotenoids. You have, even though you have do not much of pro A, you have lutein, zeaxanthin which acts as an antioxidant. But that is a different part. But uh, as a preference we always like white maize. Suppose you have developed a white hybrid and you are, you are growing you know white uh, parental lines for maintenance. Your friend, you are at the beside field, he has grown white, yellow maize. So, what will happen? You cannot stop pollen. You can stop him or her to come to your and others' field, but you cannot stop the pollen, right? So, pollen will come. Now, look at here. In the white background, there are yellow grains. Why? Because the pollen from the yellow maize, that is capital Y1, has fertilized uh, the eggs of the small Y1, small Y1. So, the genotype of the yellow is one. What? capital Y1, small Y1, small Y1. So like that in the you know shrunken 2 is a recessive gene again the pollen from normal maize comes you will get a round kernel. It is basically a contamination nothing else but how Xenia works you can also explain with this kind of cops okay. It is not segregating in any 3 is to 1 let me tell you because it is a random pollen which has come right. Uh, penetrance and expressivity is also very very important. What is penetrance? Penetrance is the ability of a gene to express right and uh, many cases even though gene is present but it may not express right. Why? Because there could be suppressor in the background uh, 100 individuals are there all are capital A capital A only 90 percent produces red color 10 percent does not produce any color why? We will say the penetrance of that gene is 90 percent. Similarly another thing is expressivity. What is expressivity? It is the degree of expressions right. So, 90 percent is giving red color, but the question is whether red color is uniform, whether it is variable. If it is uniform, I will call it as, we will call it as uniform expressivity. If it is varying, we call it as variable expressivity. So, many times what happens, uh, there are so many things. We all in Delhi and other conditions and others, we may be, you know, infected with malaria or many diseases, but the extent of expression will vary. Some may have very high degree of fever and so much as so that you know he needs a hospitalization. Others may have mild fever, it is well if you take good food and all that in the home you, we may be cured. So what happened? The expression of certain because, because what happens those, those genes from the pathogen could not express much because your defense mechanism was much better, right. So both of them expressed but then the intensity was more somewhere it is less. So this is how it is we can explain in maize also. Somebody was asked about DH. So this is the haploid inducer lines. Now what happens uh, here there is now the haploid inducer gene is now known this is called MATL matrilineal. When it is dominant so what happens there is no haploid production. So if you self a haploid inducer line you will get seed everywhere. Once this capital uh, wild type allele is replaced by a recessive allele that becomes an inducer right. Inducer means what? After fertilization your endosperm will be normal 3N but the M in embryo the only the female N will be working the male N will be aborted. So what happens is the maternal haploids. Here it is a recessive homozygotes but you see there are some small patches these are called 
what barren places it happened because of the embryo abortion right so what happens here embryo abortion is a phenomena of this recessive homozygotes here what happens although embryo abortion is taking place but not in all cases so it is only happening only in only in out of say i'll say if you count the grains 8 to 10% of the grains is having this embryo abortion so what i'll say the penetrance of this recessive ematl gene is only 90% only 10%, sorry, only 10%, because 10% is aborting. So, with giving this means, we can give an example of how penetrants are working. The expressivity can be, expre uh, can be explained very well using, using OPEC2 or the QPM aspect. What is QPM? QPM is nothing but OPEC2 plus modifier genes, right. Now, uh, what happens? We have developed a small O2O2 lines and we have put it on the X-ray box. X-ray light box is the one where we see the X-ray sheets now, where bones and everything can be seen. Now, where light passes through, it gives the orange color. White li where light doesn't pass through, it gives the black color. Black color, that's why it's called opaque. Now, every grain is, you see, O2O2, but in some of the cases, the expression of blackness or the opaqueness is varying. Here it is 100%, here it is much less, orange is there, here it is orange is there. So, that means what? Everywhere opaqueness is there, but the extent is varying, right? So, we'll, this is an example of variable expressivity. So, with this, we can, uh, we can also show uh, to the students how expressivity works. We also know what is pleiotropy. Pleiotropy is one gene with multiple effects. Now, opaque 2 is the one where you, we see the uh, grains will be soft, the black on the light box, but then it has got the enhanced level of lysine and tryptophan. So, OPEC2 gene has got two effects. One is increase of lysine and tryptophan and also creation of softness. Of course, you cannot see lysine tryptophan, but we can give them the bar diagram uh, as a photograph. Simultaneously, they can see the uh, grains on the disc where it is really very easily visible to see how much is the extent of opaqueness on the light box. So, this gives an example of pleiotropy, jumping genes. We all know that McClintock was the uh, one who, who basically uh, discovered jumping genes. Now, here you see uh, there is a gene called C1, colored one, uh, but that colored one gene was interrupted by a transposable element called T, so it becomes colorless. And in some of the cases during cell division, the transposable element comes out, and therefore the C1 gene function is restored, so it should be colored. Now, you look at here, what happens? The background is white because it is interrupted, but the cells where T has come out, it has started giving the pigmentation, right? So, this is how we can explain how jumping genes work in terms of giving this kind of expression. So, wherever white is there, that means the gene remains to be interrupted by transposable element. Where the spot starts coming, it is because of the, that means on those cells, you have the transposable element come out, of, has already come out of the gene and gene has started getting functional. Now, larger patch means what? It has come out at the early stage of development small patches means it has come out letters because it is like you know this there is a one cell one becomes two two becomes four like that the cell of cell division takes place right so this is also with the maze curve we can also explain linkage is one of them now you look at here uh, we talked about sweet corn which is uh, this shunken one now there is another gene called a1 anthocyanin 1 it gives the anthocyanin pigmentation in the plant and these two genes are present uh, with 140 kb apart 140 kb essentially in maize means less than 1 centimorgan means very very tightly linked and uh, this is the dominant allele so basically it's, it is present in a coupling phase both the dominant gene is presenting uh, in the same promo on the same chromosome when capital sh2 is there the grain will be round when small sh2 is there this it will be shrunken right here now here with this recessive one, the recessive anthocyanin gene is also there. So, what happens whenever small SH2 goes, it will try to take small A1. Whenever the round one goes, it will take the anthocyanin one, right. Now, we, this is the F2 seeds. This is F2 seeds. We have taken these F2 seeds, grown some round seeds, grown some shrunken seeds. Now, here is the purple pigmentation from the round and these ones are from the shrunken <coughs> seeds where there is no pigmentation. So, if you germinate the seed by 10 days time, you will be able to see whether pigment is there at the base of the seedlings or not. So, this is also an example of what? Complete linkage where 
if you grow small, small sample, it will be a complete linkage. But if you grow 1,000, 10,000 something, you can get definitely some recombinants because the crossing over will take place. So here what is happening is uh, we can correlate some seed phenotype with the plant pigmentation. So this we can give an example of complete linkage. Uh, okay, now cytoplasmic inheritance, we all know that uh, uh, the genes are present in cytoplasm also, mitochondria and chloroplast. So if you may cross, you will get entire cytoplasm from the female, but if you may crosses, what will happen? Your F1 will be having cytoplasm again from the female, so there is a reciprocal difference. If you go to F2, what happens? Your nuclear gene will segregate, but the cytoplasm will remain same. It is exactly same as that of the maternal in maternally effect maternal effect genes because there you will get reciprocal difference. There also you did not get any seg segregation. Then the only difference is you have to go to F3, where in F3 in that case we will get segregation. Here you will continue to have no segregation at all, right? So one of the classical example of any trait which is governed by cytoplasmic inheritance in maize is male sterility. We know that there are TCS male sterility cell cytoplasms are there. What happens is, you know, nowadays earlier hybrids used to be in maize, used to be three, three line system. That means A, B and R line system. But uh, we all know the example of Texas cytoplasm, what happened to that? It became susceptible to disease and all that, so it was discontinued. Nowadays everything is done on annual decasseling because it is easy. So it become two line system, you take a male, you with machine or the hand, you cut the tussle of the female plant and you allow the pollen to come and fertilize, that is what it is. Nowadays, the, so therefore it was become obsolete almost the utilization of male sterile cytoplasm in hybrid breeding in maize. Now we are, it, it is utilized for nowadays for baby corn purpose. Why? Because baby corn is the one which is the cob actually, which is the, un, which is the younger cob where it is basically unfertilized year, right. It's a, it's a maternal tissue. Uh, if you grow a baby corn, if you are a baby corn farmer, you have to detussel the, you have to remove the tussel, which is called detasseling. Why you have to remove? You have to remove because, suppose for various reason, if you, if you uh, fail to harvest the baby corn on time, the pollen will start fertilizing the baby corn here and the, and the grain will start forming quickly. So you will lose the quality of the baby corn. That's why farmers detussel it. And uh, what happens, almost 8 to 10,000 rupees per hectare is invested because of detasseling of this baby corn once, okay. So if you grow a male sterile baby corn, what happens? It is genetically detasseled, you don't require it. So at IRI, we have developed a male sterile baby corn hybrid where it is male fertile, you see the pollens have come out in the tussle. Here there is no pollen or anther has come out. It is completely male sterile because of T cytoplasm there. So in this, I suppose uh, Dr. Vignesh showed what is male sterile, so we use that. So what happens if we can give maize seeds, male sterile and male fertile seed to the students, what can be done is it, it can be grown in the field or pots and in maybe 60 days time the plant will start flowering and very easily we can demonstrate this is fertile and this is sterile. hardy Winberg equilibrium you all know, uh, just want to mention here that, uh, uh, okay let me see here. In maize, using maize we can give very easily the hardy Winberg equilibrium. What happens if the color one, R1 gene is segregating in the population, that means suppose you are taking a composite, right. So what happens, uh, based on the color, as mentioned you can differentiate the genotype, the darkest one will have all dominant, then two dominant, one recessive and all, based on the color. Suppose you have taken a sample of 430 and these are your number, right. So you can calculate the genotypic frequency as 135 by 430, that is 0.31. You can calculate the genotypic frequency of heterozygote as 0.64 and this should be recessive homozygote because of the, you know, computer this one, it has become this, small r1, small r1, r1 it is 0.05, right. And if you know the genotypic frequency, you can calculate the gene frequency also, that is the homozygote plus half of heterozygote. So here the frequency of capital R1 allele is 0.63, here it is 0.63. 37. So, if you have a composite, uh, you know, uh, which is in which random mating is going on and where this color is segregating, this purple color versus white color because of the R1 gene. So, if any cob is given, if the cob is your sample of the composite, you can calculate, once you calculate the color, you I mean, count the color, you can designate the genotype 
if you designate the genotype, then you can easily calculate what is the genotypic frequency and what is the gene frequency. So by single cob, you can also demonstrate Hardy-Winberg equilibrium, how it operates uh, in, in case of maize. Well, we know that phenylketonuria, I'm not going into much detail. We can use this principle for, you know, to calculate gene and genotypic frequency for different diseases in human. We do it for phenylketonuria. Then for, we can also calculate the blood group uh, for frequency of the AB, uh, you know, O allele, either in genotype or gene and genotypic frequency. So these are some of the problems. Uh, this is possibly the last slide. Maize is the best example to show inbreeding depression and heterosis, right? If you develop inbred, so it has become smaller, the cobs is very, very small, right? So we have developed, this is a PUSA Vivek QPM9 improved, the hybrid which you have seen, seen in the field. So we make crosses which have got small ears, and then in the F1, we have got a big ear. So this is a classical example of heterosis, and this is an example of uh, inbreeding depression. And how to calculate heterosis, we can explain to the students, especially in the school, uh, so suppose average year of the parent one is 60 gram. The average, uh, the, I mean the weight of the average year of parent two is 80 grams and the hybrid is 220 grams. That means it is heterosis taking place. So you can calculate average heterosis. You can calculate retrobeltiosis. You can also calculate economic heterosis considering any commercial check, okay? So if cob is given, they can weigh in their balance and they can, if you can give the cobs of P1, P2 and F1, so one can calculate how much is the extent of heterosis in that crop, right? So with this, uh, what happened is we have come out with now uh, 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 an article with the name of Genetics on a Maze Cob, a teaching tool for schools. Basically, we started addressing the schools first. Uh, and here, uh, 21 different concepts, which mostly I have mentioned, it has been you know, demonstrated using the Maze Cob. So if the Maze Cob is given, uh, explanation is given to you. You can see how dominance, recessivity, law of segregation, uh, law of independent assortment, test cost, maternal effect, all these things, including the epistasis. I'm, I have not yet shown the epistatic part of it. So all the 21 different basic concepts, these are all basic concepts, any geneticist should know it. Am I right or wrong? Right? So therefore, uh, with the main scop, we can explain these basic phenomena. And uh, oh, we have a plan that will make a kit kind of thing where each and every cob with a full demonstration will be made available and that will be distributed to all the schools there. Later on, we may target universities. So when a school teacher goes to school, he or she can explain to the school children, look, this is how is the 3 is to 1 segregation. This is how is 9 is to 3 is to 1 segregation or whatever it is. So that was it is. Maybe the soft copies uh, that Gopal will provide to you as a, as your, as a, as a uh, resource material. Uh, well, I'd like to thank again uh, my council, director, joint director research, head uh, division of genetics. And uh, behind this, uh, you know, our uh, director general, Dr. T. Mohapatra, played a very important role to, to, to have, to conceptualize and to, to come out with this kind of programs. Uh, Dr. Ashok K. Singh is our head division of genetics and joint director research. We all work under his leadership. So it is basically sir who actually, you know, uh, ship the uh, the development of these talks, and uh, how to how to demonstrate it to the students. So uh, thanks to Sir Dr. Sir Butt is also there. He he is actually the secretary of the Genetics Trust. So Sir basically for the first time could uh, emphasize that there is a need to develop some stocks for the for the development of that. So Sarah has been also a key person in in development of this. I also thank uh, 15 Genetic Trust con Congress. And of course, you know, maize is a cross-pollinated crop. Maintenance is very, very important. You understand genetically, if smaller, smaller becomes because of contamination, capital is smaller, what will happen? No science will work because it is contaminated. You won't get the expected. So hand pollination in maize is very important. We have a big team. Uh, entire credit goes to the team, scientists, Dr. Vignesh, Dr. Rajkwar is there, who are our colleagues, and all the students like you who have been there. Uh, they are all part of our pollination program. We maintain the maize crop with the highest of purity. If you maintaining a cell pointer crop is easy. You grow, get a, get a good crop, it will be automatically selfed. Here, if you don't maintain, it will be crossed, and then you won't get any expected ratio. So, the, so I thank one and all for the, of the entire team for, for helping in developing this particular uh, you know, uh, toolkit. In practical class, I'll try to show uh, each one of these cobs segregating for this trait. It will be much clearer to 
you. Okay, with this, I'd like to thank one and all for your patient here. Okay. Any question or directly we would like to move for lunch? It's basically we all know, it's only kind of uh, development of the stocks which we can use for our explanations. Okay? If you, if you are involved in teaching in any point of time uh, in your career, please contact us. We'll be happy to share this kind of products to you so that you can in turn help uh, teaching the students. It is always good to explain certain things with the live samples, whether it is maize or any other crop. Okay then, thank you very much. Thanks, Samuel.